Hey, good morning everybody and welcome to Reptiles in the News. This first story is kind of a little bit weird and I'm gonna need your help with this one. Actually, there's a lady named Angela that has a pet alligator that is named Lily. Now, you know I have a pet alligator named RJ and I really believe that we have an incredible relationship. We understand each other. I'm not sure that he has feelings towards me, but we definitely have some kind of an understanding where he does things I want him to do. Seems to react to my voice, the way that I treat him, and I think it's pretty special. In this case, Lily, is kind of like Angela's baby. Now she's had Lily since it was two and a half days old and even when Lily was a tiny tiny baby she used to rock Lily on her rocking chair. Treated it kind of more like a dog or a cat or something like that. Now a few years later it's kind of a bigger alligator you know three and a half four foot something on that lines and Angela dresses it up in dresses, paints its nails, brushes its teeth and I don't know how I feel about this you know I mean on one side I see this relationship where I think it's really amazing. The alligator really seems to kind of go along with what Angela is doing. Puts up a little bit of a fuss, but at the same time, it doesn't seem to be aggressive, doesn't seem to be anything else, definitely getting a lot of attention, and it seems like it enjoys it to some extent. On the other side, I see some people saying, you know, hey, that might be a little bit overboard, putting dresses on an alligator, brushing its teeth, you know, is there stress to the animal? I'm not 100% sure, to be totally honest with you. I know some people get really upset when even you put a sweater on a dog, for instance, or do stuff like that to dogs. So. I have to ask you guys, how do you feel about this? I mean, is Angela taking it too far with the alligator? Is it actually causing stress to the alligator to be treated more like a dog or a cat and not as much like a reptile, which is kind of what it is? Again, I'm kind of conflicted on this. I think it's really cute. I think it's amazing. I think that it's great that it's getting attention for reptiles. And I think it's really great that it's painting a picture that reptiles aren't this kind of cold, you know, heartless type animals that only care about killing. But on the same side, I don't really know. So I definitely need help from you guys. I mean, what do you feel about this? Is that taking it too far? Is there a too far if the animal seems to be healthy and happy? It's obviously grown well and done well. Is there anything wrong with this? Go down in the comments and let me know what you think. Hi, I'm Angela and this here is Lily Gator. You're all right. <laughs> I'm not sure there's other gators that are getting foot massages and manicures. She is definitely spoiled. She does have a tiara. She has sunglasses. Good girl. Good girl. There you go. Stop, stop, stop. This next story is fascinating to me. Actually, the Leon Neuroscience Research Center actually did sleep tests on a tegu. Now, back in 2016, there was actually a test on bearded dragons saying that they actually had two sleep cycles. Basically thought to only be humans and some mammals, like some birds and stuff like that, that had both a slow wave as well as a REM. Now, the REM sleep cycle is basically when people dream. Prior to this research, people didn't think that animals like reptiles could actually dream or go into a REM state. In 2016, they found that bearded dragons actually did have the two sleep cycles, which were similar to what we saw in mammals. Now, they've done a new research on the Argentine tegu, and sure enough, it has two sleep cycles as well. Now, it's interesting, in humans, the REM sleep cycle, which causes dreams, is actually recognized from cerebral and ocular activity that is similar to when you're awake. Interestingly enough, the bearded dragons had a different and slower ocular pattern than they were when they were awake. Now, even more weird is the Argentine was even different than the bearded dragon, which makes this really bizarre. Not really sure what that means. Just means that both the bearded dragon, the Argentine, and mammals all have slightly different REM cycles as far as ocular activity. Don't know if they're dreaming. I don't know what they're dreaming about, but I think these types of research projects are absolutely amazing, and I'd like to know from you guys. I mean, are you as excited as I am to think that these animals are so much more intelligent than most people have given them credit for for hundreds and hundreds of years? What will we find out in the near future? I don't know, but I sure am excited about it. And like with every week, we take a break from the news and we just go go ahead and share things that I have found on the interwebs that I absolutely love. This first picture is actually a T-positive green anaconda from RL Exotics. Wow, that animal is incredible. I actually remember seeing a T-positive albino at Ben Rennick's collection. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Maybe this is that animal. I have no idea. Nevertheless, I think it's absolutely incredible. And years ago, Stan Churis had T-positive and T-negative albino green anacondas. I don't know whatever happened to those. I would like to see those mutations being produced because I love green 
Green Anacondas. Way to go, RL Exotics. Next up would be this incredible Amazon tree boa that was posted by Snake Buddies. I just think that they're unbelievable animals. This picture is incredible, and that's all I have to say about it. Well, this isn't actually a picture, but it is a short video of what they call the hairy bush viper. I know insert jokes here. Ironically enough, I actually have a tattoo of one of those right here. So this is a great animal. I've always thought they were so weird looking. And I absolutely love this video by Tom Carlton. And then check out this picture of the Silver Transpecos rat snake by Melissa Barr. I tell you what, Silver Transpecos were produced probably about 25 years ago. And there was a bunch of mutations. There was blondes, there were silvers, there were even albinos, believe it or not. And subocularis or Transpecos rat snakes, you don't see around that much anymore. And I always wonder what happened to those mutations and essentially you have a blonde face that was being caught in the wild on somewhat a regularity and then being reproduced in captivity and then there was an azanthic that was bred to a blonde that ultimately produced the silver transpecos like in this picture pretty incredible again you don't see hardly any of these around anymore i haven't seen an albino transpeco in probably at least eight or ten years so i don't even know if they're out there if you guys know go ahead in the comment let me know who's working with these amazing rat snakes but regardless this one is an absolute beauty. Next up is a cool story that comes from a place called Snake Road. It's actually at the Shawnee National Forest in Illinois. Now I've actually been to Snake Road. What's interesting about Snake Road is that they actually close about a mile section of the road twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall for migration of animals. You basically have forest and bluffs on one side and then swampland on the other side. And what happens in the spring, all the animals that have been hibernating in the bluffs actually come cross the road and get into the swamp area where there's plethora of food and where they actually live during the warm weather months. And then, of course, in the fall, they do the exact opposite. They migrate past the road and they go back into the bluffs for their hibernation season. Thankfully, they actually shut the road down so that these animals can cross without being killed by cars and stuff like that. I've actually been there during some of this migration season and it's absolutely amazing. One night, I actually saw 27 water moccasins within about an hour. Not to mention there were several other species of reptiles and a bunch of newts and frogs. It was absolutely incredible. Now what's interesting is this year it typically is only closed for two weeks in the fall and that was going to end on October 31st, of course Halloween. They actually extended it to November 6th because the weather has been so weird. So the fact that it stayed warmer longer meant the animals weren't migrating when they thought they were going to migrate and they hadn't actually all crossed the road in the two-week period. Thankfully they ended up noticing this and they extended it an entire week so that the animals could get across the road safely. Now, it brings up a couple things. Number one, I think it's amazing that the wildlife officials in Illinois are so good about their animals because they really have extended this time so that animals didn't perish. Secondly, it does bring up a point, you know, with the climate changing, what are we starting to see? We're starting to see a lot of things happening with reptiles. In this case, they weren't migrating the same pattern that they had for decades before. We're certainly starting to see things like chytrid virus and other funguses that are starting to appear in animals because of the weather changing. It's definitely something to keep an eye on. In this particular case, it's a great story in the fact that Snake Road was actually closed so that the animals didn't perish. But there's a bigger, more concerning underlying thing here that we have to all start thinking about. How is this going to affect our wildlife moving forward? Because let's face it, not all situations like this are going to end in this type of story. But in conclusion with this story, if you ever get a chance to get down to Southern Illinois, you definitely want to check out the migration. It is absolutely spectacular. This last story I've been following kind of online, but I don't really know a lot about it. Louis Cavallera actually owns this amazing piebald boa constrictor. Now, I heard about this four or five months ago that a piebald boa constrictor was either produced or found. I'm not even really sure, but it was in Mexico. Now, I know Louis now has the animal, but I don't even know if Louis is in this country, if he's still in Mexico. I really don't know a whole lot about it, but the Reptile Report actually posted a picture, just kind of mentioned something that said, hey, it might be something that interesting down the road. Who knows what's happening? I've been saying this for a long time. A piebald boa constrictor, and one just like like this is really a gold mine. I mean, that is that next animal that everyone's been waiting for that will be like this huge, huge thing. The piebald reticulated pythons were that way. Certainly the piebald ball python started kind of the whole ball python craze as far as high end ball pythons. I have no doubt that this is going to do amazing things for the boa constrictor world. And the fact that it's a Central American boa means it's going to stay a little smaller. They definitely reproduce a lot better. So I would think that this is going to be a recessive mutation that's going to be able to be reproduced relatively quickly. 
Exactly. I don't know much more about it other than the fact that I think it's absolutely incredible and I can't wait to follow along what's going on. I hope that these animals are available one day because I would certainly love to own one. And with that said, I am going to go ahead and end the news today and wish you guys an absolutely amazing day. Be kind to someone and you have been watching Reptiles in the News.